really greatly wired rooms. I used it for classes last year for both large, for seminar, small seminars and larger classes, and it seemed to work out really well. And when it came time for people to like to do presentations, you know, really, students at Concordia sort of swim in the media. You know, you, everyone just has basic knowledge of how you use websites and how you get around and stuff. So I just want to, in this course, go one step beyond that and say, okay, we all live, you know, with like data skin in some ways. We're like, we're all been imbued with technology and it doesn't stay outside of ourselves. It comes and invades our, enriches our imagination. It affects the way we communicate and how we think. We have cell phones. If you're a student here, you're using computers undoubtedly. And, you know, we've really been deeply affected by technology. The relationship between technology and gender, technology and sexuality, technology and class, technology and race. What does it mean, for example, to live in a world in which there really is a real digital divide in every culture? Real digital divide between those who can afford access to the latest technologies and those who can't afford access. And what happens when the workforce around the world becomes technologically organized? You know, when some smart alex from Harvard University, you know, come out of Harvard and then begin to say, well, gee, we could develop a country, a, a corporation like Nike. Nike could really use like computerization. They could have a very cheap workforce and use a lot of children's labor. And I don't mean to pick on poor Nike. There's probably many mall transnationals we could pick on. But use, you know, people working at poverty rates for labor in third world countries so the goods could be produced someplace. And on the other hand, we could ship those goods very inexpensively and sell them for, you know, relatively yeah. high prices or competitive prices in Western Europe, Japan, North America. We could actually reorganize labor relations around the world by taking advantage of technologies of distribution and technologies of communication. So what does it mean to live in a world in which, on a globalized basis, you know, the technological euphoria of what Marshall McLuhan once said would be the, the global village becomes, in many ways, like the global sweatshop? What does it mean when New Brunswick says that it's using technology you know, to its utmost when it uh, begins to set itself up with a series of telephone systems, you know, telephone call centers. People are paid minimal wages and they answer calls for, you know, repairing computers, calls for selling goods. And rather than have those call centers located as used to be in real third world countries like Bangladesh, they in fact begin to migrate to New Brunswick. Why they begin to migrate to a city like Montreal? Because after all, people here have real linguistic skills and you can use computer technologies for call centers here as well. So I think in this class, we will really think through the issues of, in part, what is the relationship of new technologies to labor relations? Is it empowering or disempowering? What is the relationship of technology to war? I noticed this morning that Donald Rumsfeld, you know, Bush gave a, President Bush, gave a speech this afternoon saying we're getting the war, you know, we have to get ready really for armed conflict against Iraq and trying to mobilize public opinion. And I just noticed a short clip from Donald Rumsfeld, the American Secretary of Defense or of War, in which Secretary Rumsfeld says really we have to prepare ourselves these days for virtual war. You know, we have to use technologies for better forms of warfare itself, which you might think is a flippant comment. But then just go up on the internet and go to a site called usspace.com, usspace.com. And it's a, from a political point of view, it's a really important thing to think about because usspace.com lays out in very general terms from the point of view of the American military of what will be the use of the latest cybernetic technologies, the latest forms of computer technologies and of satellite delivery systems and of laser systems for fighting in the future cybernetic battlegrounds of the mid 20th century itself. It's a 20 year prospectus of what is going to be the future of warfare itself. So I thought, well, in the class of media and technology and politics, I think we really should talk about, you know, these kind of futurist scenarios, not just have like hype about, you know, new technologies, but in fact, from a critical point of view, say, well, what does this mean for how war is going to be waged in the future? And anyway, what does it mean when we live in supposedly advanced technological societies and you find yourself living one year later in the anniversary of 9-11. And you say, well, you might, the 
propaganda, you know, the hype in our country might be that we live in this kind of spectacular kind of hygienic bubble dotted with shopping malls and everything like that, sort of insulated from around the world. But then 9-11 happens with its tragedy and its the chaos breaks around in the world. And you know, I thought to myself, well, really there are just such deeply competing world visions today. There really are like tribal forces. You know, America is one tribe and Canada is one tribe, but there are a lot of other tribes around the world and some people aren't just fueled by dreams of economic productivity, they're real religious dreams as well. There are people whose imagination is not the 21st century, there's people whose imagination is the 11th century and the 13th century. And we're all living together technologically in the global village. So what really is the story of technology, media, and politics? So with those kind of thoughts, I thought it'd be interesting that we just sort of deal with some of these things on a, themes on a course called Media Technology and Politics. Now my name is Arthur Croker. My office is just up the street on Bishop Street. It's K201. I have official office hours. I'll be sitting on a chair in that office Wednesday, 2 to 3.30. Uh, I'll just be there if you want to come and see me. Uh, but if you want to see me at any time, any other time, I really would like to see you. Any other time you would like to, I would just ask that you contact me first just to make sure we're in the same physical place at the same time. And the easiest way to contact me, you could use a phone if you want, but really in reality, email, email is always better, I think, because at least it's, you get into it. And yesterday my phone wasn't working, so I, so go email, I think, really. Or you can phone, it, like during office hours, at 848-2112, definitely be there. And I usually, I mean, either in that office or up at the journal office, which is in, up the hill in Concordia, and that's 848-2119. So try to use the last number sparingly if you could because Ted will have to be picking up the phone too many times. Okay, So you can get in touch with me anytime. And anytime you want to get together and talk, just great. Just let me know and I'll be where, you know, just make sure we're together. So let me now just go, I'll just read through quickly as I can just the themes of the course and then just go through the grading and things like this. The themes of the course are pretty straightforward. It starts off with the notion that technological change is transforming politics and culture and society. In communications, the creation of the internet and the World Wide Web have practically realized, but the, you know, the real Canadian guru of communications called the development of the global village, Marshall McLuhan's notion of the global village. And in this class, a lot, some of the discussion we take, particularly at the first, we're really going to look at you know, a whole series of utopian perspectives on technology like Michael Benedict's article in this book, which is just a beautiful, beautiful perspective. He says that technology is just not objects. Technology represents like, you know, dreams of different ways of living and of communicating. And it has really deeply anthropological origins. It has mythic origins itself. Marshall McLuhan, when he would talk about technology, would say technology really represents something which is so deep to our identity. Technology represents really almost like in a religious epiphany. And you can find that like in a lot of the cyber literature, in a lot of, you know, literature on, you know, people who are really attracted to new technologies of communication. Who will say like we saw when you like, you know, Neuromancer and William Gibson's book Neuromancer that when you jack into cyberspace, you in fact begin to live in two bodies simultaneously. You have your physical body, it's got flesh on it, it's got sort of weight and it's kind of inertial. But then if you're on the net, you, in fact, are living in a different kind of space. They even have a name for it. Eh? They call it real time and kind of real space. And I'd think it's really interesting. I would think it's interesting to think, well, is it really real time? What is the notion? What does it mean for us? It's like, you know, we're pioneers of new technologies. We constantly experience them. What does it mean with most media that we have become deeply habituated to living in many places at the same time? that you can be on your cell phone one time, you can be using the internet, you can be uh, uh, watching television, and at the same time you're hungry or you're home or you're carrying on a conversation with someone. You're in your physical, you have a physical space, but you're also living in a virtual space. What kind of dislocation do we suffer on account of that? I think it, we read a lot of the articles in this book you know, are really articles about dislocation. And some are for dislocation, but there's a lot of articles which say are troubled, particularly articles by a lot of women in this book, are pretty troubled about that. 
and articles that are going to look like uh, Donna Haraway. She's a wonderful, excuse me, thinker of technology. She's a theorist, and she teaches at the University of Santa Cruz. And she has a great book in this article on cyborgs. And she says, you know, like feminism is like so deeply involved with the notion of new technologies. In fact, the notion of the cyborg, she says, is not new. It really represents like a feminist, like a woman's perspective on the world. We've always known this kind of space. And she goes on then to say the coming of the cyborg, the coming of new technologies, opens up tremendous possibilities for, you know, like sort of emancipated women's consciousness. And Sadie Plant, another political thinker and political theorist from Britain, will say exactly the same thing but in different ways itself. So really, there's many perspectives in this on the question of what does it mean to live in, be dislocated? And even one step beyond that, not only to be like dislocated and going between different spaces and different times, but something really different that you, in fact, forget about it. It just becomes normal life. It's like the language of the everyday. And if you're like in your, if you're, you know, when you finish university or during university and you get a job and then you find out the Marshall McLuhan's Global Village sort of falls down to earth in a big crash and you're sitting eight hours a day at a computer terminal and you're overloaded with 400 messages and you find out the technologies of communication are not allowing you to work less. They're in fact really speeding up your work and really putting stress on you. Like a friend of mine who was a consultant working between New York and San Francisco and their company then discovered the internet and they said, wow, this is fabulous. We can actually, small company, we can actually be a global consulting firm just by using the internet. We can get bids from Britain. We can do them in San Francisco. You know, we can creatively reorganize our time and space. And what they found out quickly, though, was that the project was so successful, their bodies were so accessible to saying, people saying, you know, give us a, uh, you know, a prospectus for this or a bid for this, that suddenly they found themselves accelerating in their amount of work, but also accelerating in the kind of speed and anxiety they had to deal with the overloaded stress. They weren't members of the global village. They really had, you know, like accelerated and really deeply overloaded bodies. And my friend sort of came, that came to a crashing halt when my friend woke up one morning in a Chicago uh, hotel room and said, oh, this is very curious. I can't move my arm. I can't move my leg and realized he was having a major stroke and fell out of bed. And, you know, strangers come in, take him off to the hospital. And he says, well, I'm sort of proud of it. I'm, you know, I like to tell people why I almost gave my life for my work. And then proceeded to stop that work entirely and took up, went to a nice house in Long Island and has been writing books ever since and reflecting on the scenario. So, I mean, for myself, these are like really realistic stories of media, technology, and politics. And it's not technology, it's just you know, particular objects. It's technology as a way of communicating and a way of thinking and a way of working and a way of organizing a society. And this course will be a specific and a general course beginning to reflect on the implications of that as deeply as we can. So in politics, information um, technology has expanded the democratic possibilities of what, how, and when we know actual events in public life, both nationally and globally. But that's sort of true, but let's face it, it's not really true. Because what about those little GPS systems that are being put in all cell phones for next year? Have you heard about this? It's a real sneaky thing the American government is doing. I don't mean particularly critical of the American government, but this is pretty sneaky. Is there quietly passed legislation that by next year, probably in all event, every cell phone, or in the next two years, every cell phone is going to have quietly installed in it little GPS coding systems so that the state will always know where you are, you know, global positioning systems, even if maybe you don't know where you are yourself or you're not sure where you are after, you know, a night in St. Catherine Street or something having, you know, and you say, well, really, the technology of that sort, you, know, you like to have cell phones, but does the price for a cell phone mean you're not going to have privacy? You're just completely overexposed to the state, to power itself. What happens in technological societies to very traditional and good questions of civil liberties. What happens to questions of, I have a right to privacy. I don't always want people to know where I am. You know, you know these are long-standing democratic 
values within our culture, which most people seem to publicly respect as a culture. And what happens when a little GPS system is put into a cell phone and suddenly that's gone to all intents and purposes? Or what happens when technologies of surveillance become completely ubiquitous, like in Britain? Right? Britain has, you know, I think it has probably more surveillance cameras than it has citizens. It's just really ubiquitous surveillance systems. And don't worry if you go to Britain. It's not bad, you know. It's always done for your own good. There are dangerous predators on the streets. There are two men are going to, sorry, women going to snatch children. Who knows when children, you know, all the, we can all agree these are terrible things and you don't want them to happen. And suddenly for sake of that, many streets like in Birmingham, England, have just tons of surveillance cameras. The police are watching the whole city all the time. And you say, well, is this how technology works? That it gets established, never in the language of control, but it really established itself in the language of what I would call facilitation. It's for more improved knowledge, for your greater safety. Who wouldn't want to have a little chip if, you're, if you have children, for example? Who wouldn't want to have a little chip put in the back of your baby's neck? Because I didn't like what I said. Who wouldn't want to have a chip put in the back of your baby's neck? Because after all, your baby could always be tracked. Your baby could be scanned. No one could easily steal your baby any longer. It'll be for your own good. And if you're a mother, the question you'll be saying, you know, you say, well, I don't think I want to have a chip in my baby's neck. And the medical people may well say to you, well, I mean, do you care about your baby? And then, you know, you feel sort of like ambivalent, you know, in sort of issues of privacy, and, you know, your autonomy as a mother and as, you know, raising a family itself. So I would just say these technological issues, they don't come like big things into culture. They just sort of win their way in. And they are always come to us in the, like a language of facilitation, but they typically end up as a language of control. And this course takes place in a real context because the hype is finished. We are not living in the midst of tech hype any longer. We are living in the detritus, the party's over, and the crash has happened. But the real technologies have not gone away. The technologies of control really exist. And there's a real political struggle going on in every inch of the internet over what the creative uses of technology, like music. I assume most people in here are deep into music culture. Are you deep into stealing music and stuff? <laughs> yes, I hope so. Well, because if you, like you write such a great paper on that, because eh? you, you know, begin with Napster and then go to Noodle and others. And you know, really, it's because for myself, it's just like such a bitter generational war. It's like the young want to have unimpeded access to new relations of music, new ways of distributing something you love, you know, bands you like or sounds you like and stuff like this. And then you got the record companies who want to just shut it right down. And you know their newest trick, because they can't convince people to police themselves, you know, because there's just a really an insatiable demand for file exchanging music, their newest gambit is they're going to try to convince everyone this year and next year to spend $150 for a new kind of digital you know, CDs, basically, which will do one great thing, is you can't then record and you can't do file exchange on them. So they can just convince you to spend the money to buy this consumer product. You will then be locked out of the benefits of the internet. You know, Noodle and things like that will be gone. So I would say that these are, you know, the issues of technology like really impact us. And they impact us sort of, you know, individually and certainly for you generationally. And that kind of war goes on, you know, kind of like tech wars, I would think of it, at every inch of the net. Like there's such tech wars go over, well, what kind of internet are we going to have? Is it going to be just run by a business model? Or are we going to have an internet that maybe is creative if people want to learn different ways of writing, as happens on the internet? Well, why shouldn't people be able to use the internet to distribute their writing in very creative ways? Or if you want to do file exchanges, which are multimedia, well, there could be really creative possibilities, you know, and people really struggle for this. So. In medicine, biogenetics is challenging traditional conceptions of gender and identity and evolution and the body while posing very real problems as to whether we're serving technology or technology is imposing its ends upon us. In the economy, this there's a chair there. <laughs>
in the economy, the spectacular crash of the new economy marks the end, I think, of one phase of the digital revolution. And I think we should talk in this class about the big crash that's happened, the fiber optic crash, because there was such, you know, for the last five years, there's been such massive hype about fiber optic and the realization of the global village. And only in the last year does, you know, from an economic point of view, this fiber optic collapse completely. Find out there's not the unlimited demand for it. And they also find out something very interesting. They find out that a lot of the tech firms have really gone virtual all right, but not gone virtual in terms of technology, but gone virtual in terms of accounting procedures. You know, and so we'll have some discussions in this class of what virtuality really means when it comes to accounting procedures. What happens in the, when the new economy means that the actual creation of new relations of economic production are radically disconnected from their actual use value. And you have dreams of fiber optic, but it turns out mostly to be a stock market scam. You know, like a very traditional kind of thing. I thought, well, be, if you're interested in like economic issues and labor issues, you know, is really rich fruit. And you can also, um, you know, you can also have great graphic, graphics for your paper, which is the legions of CEOs being led away to prison these days with handcuffs on them, led by Martha Stewart. So we're living, I think, at the beginning of a new era in information technology, the shape and destiny of which is still unclear. In ways deeper than we realize, technology is an essential part of human identity. It's how we communicate. It's a context within which we think. The new media, it's the new media by which we see, hear, and understand the world around us. In many more ambivalent ways than we know, we are the wired world. So what this course will do is begin with a basic kind of discussion, right at the start of this book, in section one of the book. It'll begin with a discussion of the meaning of the wired world, what this book called cyberculture. And by cyberculture, it means like a computer-mediated society. But of course, there's a much more dangerous notion of cyber, eh, that goes back to cyberpunk, like writers like Bruce Sterling and William Gibson and others. You know, the whole kind of California revolution in the late 80s and early 90s, who said themselves, said really, you know, computer-mediated culture is a real bore taken by itself. You know, it should really represent cyberpunk. It should really represent a way of individual empowerment, a real way in which you sort of cut yourself out from the herd and you can begin to do sort of interesting things, begin to begin to live in different spaces. Or as Donna Haraway or Ella Carey, Sandy Stone down at the University of Texas would say, really it could usher in an age in which we really get used to having excuse me, porous identities, you know, in which we break boundaries. We don't have like sharp divides between things. We in fact begin to be more firm. We begin to be more ambivalent about things. We begin to have identity structures, which are just like, sort of like the life in the internet in some ways. You know, they're on the margins in some ways, at the center of things in some ways. You're not even sure about questions of gender. Because if you go off on the internet, questions of the one of the real impacts of the internet is really to dislocate or displace questions of gender and to really make ambivalent what it means to be a guy, what it means to be a you know, female gender, what it means to be transsexual. There's a lot of discussions in this class on technology and sexuality, on the relationship of the internet to, for example, gay and lesbian culture but beyond gay and lesbian culture, well, what does the internet mean to transsexual culture? What does the internet mean to really forms of sexual difference within the world itself? And they're really fundamental discussions. Now, most tech hype discussions don't sort of like allow that. But this discussion in this class, in this book that we're going to use, you know, really focuses on that to a certain extent, in addition to asking other questions. So we'll begin with a discussion of cyberculture whether viewed in optimistic terms as a utopia or as a kind of matrix-like, have you seen matrix, well, like a matrix-like dystopia of android machines and electronic surveillance, the reality of a computer-mediated culture dominates the social and political imagination, focusing on themes related to the changing meaning of class and power and gender and sexuality and race and colonization and the body We'll discuss some of the key political issues related to the emergence of information technology. And then the course is going to conclude with a reflection on the digital future 
It's going to conclude with the ways in which the dynamic growth of a computer-mediated society also transforms the direction and content of the political imagination. And you know, like Montreal, like such a fabulous place, and I feel like really as a teacher, I feel really privileged to teach this course in Montreal. Because Montreal is like the perfect cybernetic city. Because it's got it all, eh? Because it's got like utopian, madcap utopian dreams. These utopian ambitions. To Paul Martin, a friend of mine saw at the University of Toronto, heard a speech by Paul Martin yesterday. And Paul Martin got up, because he has to, you know, Paul Martin got up and says, the world's a global algorithm. We can hold the world as a global algorithm in our hand. And Canada's the leading postmodern nation. I thought, well, Paul Martin's a postmodern theorist these days. Interesting. You know, like this kind of tremendous utopia. Then Steve Jobs got up from Apple Corporation and said, I am digitality. I am your future. <laughs> and I thought, well, what does that mean? I didn't know that this is my future. So you have, and then you turn your eyes around in the city of Montreal. And you go like you walk behind, you know, the um, the magazine store over here, and you, I almost felt like teaching this course in that big hole they're building. Have you seen the new integrated visual arts and engineering building they're building over there? The enormous hole in the ground. Well, it's like it's like a cyber heaven of some sort. It's going to be, you know, really put Montreal Concordia for sure in terms of facilities and the real leadership of you know the vision of of really technologically enabled visual arts and multimedia and digitality. And it's a really kind of brilliant kind of experiment in whether you can bring together engineers and visual artists. So, uh, but it also represents an enormous investment for the university, an enormous investment for the province of Quebec itself and for the government of Canada. It's a real, there's a, you know, it's a, like a real value choice has been made that that's the desirable future. I sort of contrast that, and I don't want to be churlish, but I contrast that with normal facilities for political science students. You know, slap my face. You know, as we, you know, we don't usually have the greatest tech facilities, and thanks to Patrick, you know, we have this, you know, really will turn out to be a great facility in this classroom. You know, it's a really nice thing for information technology to make this available. But it's a real utopian kind of ambition. Or you go down uh, a René Levesque, and you see that new skyscraper going up and the huge billboard for it like says, you know, what's it called, uh, the City Electronique. And I thought, well, that's like William Gibson's, that's like Neuromancer territory. It's like cyberpunk has come into Montreal architecture. And you can see even see it rising over the architect or the skyline of Montreal, you know, late nineties architectural style already obsolescent, pure glass. But it's like a vision of Cyber City, which will, you know, go over us. So Montreal is like this really creative city. And if you go like to the arts, you go down to Ouzancé or other places where there are large scale performances are going. I mean, Montreal is like a leading, leading center in multimedia art performances itself, which use technologies so fabulously creatively that you know, it just, it's so deeply emotional the way in which the technology is used by Quebec artists. You know, really creatively enhancing the technology to do just great performance art itself. But at the same time as that goes on, then you turn your eye and you say, well, Montreal is like, it is like cyber culture. You know, it's a city that prides itself on like speed and, you know, where does Montreal begin and end? You know, because the city has like data capillaries and its financial networks, which run out to the world. It's a transnational city already. You know, Montreal is not just here. Montreal technologically exists in all those data lines of communication stretching all around the world. It's part of like it's an island in the net, to use this, the title of one of Bruce Sterling's books. But at the same time as that happens, and you turn your eye and you say, well, that may be true, but Montreal is also something else. Montreal is like a real fleshy city. Walk down Rue St. Catherine and you say, this is a city you know, with a lot of experiments going on with bodies. There's a lot of really creative and cool kind of costumes people wear on a daily basis. Is really a punky culture. It has students in the street who rebel at the slightest, you know, sense of injustice that's going on. Who took the lead with students, you know, from students in the United States and around Europe, but in Quebec City, and really courageously putting your bodies up against the real oppressive forces of the state itself. So Montreal is like cyber culture, but it just means that cyber culture's got these really conflicting elements to it. It's one part technological utopian dreams reflected in 
you know, business and in architecture and in tools of education. But on the other hand, it's got real body consciousness, real kind of rough politics in the streets itself. And in a course on media, technology, and politics, how do we bring together those supposedly dislocated spaces? And so I'd say it's sort of interesting if we're going to you know, read a book like this and think about it. Well, why think in a way that's sort of estranged from Montreal? Why not think within the Montreal context itself? So we'll have some discussions in class in Montreal. So the required books are the Cyber Cultures readers. There's a lot of net readings available at ctheory.net. And the grading for the course is really simple. It goes like this. There will be a midterm examination on October 16th. Uh, I will give you the uh, questions in advance and then just bring the, uh, your questions which have been answered into class during the regular class period. So I'll give you, I'll try like a week or two weeks before, I'll give you the questions. And I'll give you one of the questions right now if you'd like to have the question. It is, uh, write your technological autobiography. Okay. So, I know. Uh, the man's gone mad completely. Okay. And you only have to do you know, two pages. You don't have to go crazy on the thing. And the technology, everyone, you know, many people will say, well, hey, I didn't know I had a technological autobiography. Well, the opening discussions that we'll have in the, in the book in Cyberculture Reader are, is really, in fact, to demonstrate that everybody has a technological autobiography. Everybody, if you think about it, has got a relationship to technology. Some it's more reflected, and some it's unreflected. You know, does, if everybody communicates here, then we can speak about technologies of communication. How to use computers, how to use the net, what is your relationship to films, what is your relationship to music, what is the ways in which you think the technology is going to influence how, what your career possibilities are going to be in the world? Are you for these possibilities? Or you find yourself sort of critical about these? Does technology for you just mean a consumer product? Or does technology mean maybe technologies of culture, technologies of imagination, technologies of sexuality? Can we broaden out the question of technology itself? Or is it so inescapable in our culture that the question of technology has been narrowed down so we can only think of it as just this narrow kind of consumer product itself? And the whole point of a politics class in media, technology, and politics is to sort of blow apart a narrow definition of technology. And so I thought, well, straight to act, you, know, you can't answer this question wrong, that's for sure. You know, you can only answer the question sincerely or unsincerely, I think, which is just be creative and just think, what is my, do I have a technological autobiography? And you're completely free to argue, of course, I do not have a technological autobiography. I would just ask you to justify your statement, that's all. Okay? So the first thing, we'll, you know, I'll go back to that, you know, like in next week, the reading. So what, one of the questions will be, just in a short space, write your autobiography, your technological autobiography. So just sort of think about that. And you can use any media you want to write your technological autobiography. Because I know, if my, if you're like other classes I've had, the amount of like music liter literacy in here will just be astonishing, well beyond mine, that's for sure. If you want to write within the medium of music, that's great. If you're into films, that's great. If you're into the net, great. If you're into gaming culture in the net, fantastic. There might be any programmers or coders in here. Okay, so hackers and programmers and coders should talk about this, if they feel like it. Because <laughs> really, you're beginning to speak about how the codes are put down, and it's really privileged knowledge in this culture. So there are lots of ways of responding to that question, but I'll just put, you know, put a choice of questions, and you answer two or three questions. No surprise, it'll be based on the text, except for write your technological autobiography, and it'll be a take-home exam. So, and I did that so to cut down the anxiety. I knew when I was a student, I never liked exams. I used to get almost catatonic, the thought of exams, and just the anxiety. And I thought, well, if I ever get to be a teacher, I'm going to try to just do this in a more humane way. So that you really try to cut down the anxiety, and it's not like testing on what you can memorize, but in fact, in, this, in the privacy of your own dwelling, you can just sort of think about questions and just creatively think about the book in your, from your own perspective and stuff, OK? So it's intended to cut down anxiety and stuff. 
The only thing that, but the deadline for October 16th is like those sharp deadlines. I don't, unless you have a medical excuse from a doctor, I just won't accept your exam. Because that wouldn't, it's not fair to the rest of the class or, you know, just, uh, you, know, you will have the questions in advance. Secondly, working individually or you can work in groups. And if you're working individually in groups, I'd like to talk to you about your projects. Develop a project that clarifies the political context of technology. That is, the relationship of technology. And it just made it as general as possible to questions of class and power and sexuality, race, colonization, identity. And you can add on indefinitely. The topic of the project should be discussed with myself. And while I might focus on writing exclusively, it can also involve writing in the context of other media, including new media and music and digital imaging and sampling, electronic art performance, web design, surveillance technology. In other words, an assignment, you can actually be creative in doing it. I know the universities, I don't want to be, I know education as a whole tries to beat, always says, be creative. And my experience of education was it tries to beat the creativity out of everyone. As my daughter used to say, she said, well, we're always told to be creative, be creative, but in grad school, you'll get to be creative. She says, but by the time you get to grad school, you've been so normalized that it's hard to sort of open your mind and relax and stuff like this. So maybe this class could be like a little oasis, and I really do like creative work. But if you don't feel particularly creative, you shouldn't immediately start sweating, say, oh, no, this is going to be terrible. So I like scholarly work, and just, you know, like serious reflections on the text. And just, but I just say that if it's a class in media technology and politics, and if you feel any facility with media, well, why not use them to do an assignment? It's so, like interesting. But there should be a written component to it as well. It's like the discipline of writing. Do you have your hand up? Uh, the, uh, last year when I taught this course, people, the, the, about the maximum, from my perspective, what would work would be about three, four was sort of stretching it, I thought, really. Because the only thing is I have to sort of, you know, make, the assignments have to be large enough so that, you know, it's fair for grading for a group as a whole, and then it depends on the project. Why do you have a gargantuan project in mind or a minor? Okay, the character, okay. Yeah, think of an idea. You should really try to get started on the assignments as quickly as possible, like this project, because it'll make the class much more interesting. You read the text, and instead of just reading it as like, here's a text and I'm reading it, you're actually reading it as someone who is in fact making your own contribution. And then when the assignments are handed, I'm gonna ask you if for those, if you don't mind, just to briefly tell the class what you've done in your work, okay? Now, I don't want anyone to start sweating or saying, oh my God, now I have to get up and speak in public, because I know that's sometimes hard, but it would be really, I knew just know from past experience that everybody in the class really appreciates just generally sharing with the kind of work that's gone on within the seminar itself. And they're always really great ideas, and that's a great tech here to use if you want to put a website or show what you put stuff on it. There'd be a, a final take home exam on November 20th, and then the participation of 10%. Okay, so and that adds up. And then late assignments won't be, will be, not be accepted without official notification according to university regulations. And I must say, like, I'm a real, real stickler on late assignments. I just don't like them at all. I think that taking a class seriously is everybody's got responsibilities. And your responsibility in this, in part, is just to do the, these assignments and make sure they come in in time. And if you are sick, of course, get a doctor's note that's, you know, that's the thing. And the other thing is, like, plagiarism. And every year, there's like a case of plagiarism. And for myself, I just find it really hard because I just think, well, hey, you know, these are take-home exams, they're assignments, and plagiarism is no place in the university. So if there's plagiarism, I just strictly follow university regulations. And, you know, I just, and, and so please don't. And if you have any doubt as to what constitutes uh, proper citation, then you should really come and talk to me. Or if you have any doubts about plagiarism or you don't want to take people's work, just come and talk to me and I'll tell you how to make sure you footnote property and stuff like this. Like really an essential part of you know an academic life and ed good education is just to do proper citations and stuff. Okay? Yeah. No, I'll give it to you beforehand. I'll try a week or two. Same thing. Yeah, no tricks or anything. I'll just give it to you. The whole point of these exams, they're called exams, but really they're just, I think like they're reflections. They're gonna be based on really 
uh, you're just reading the, the different readings that we're going to go through and then synthesize them or reflect them. And I'll try to think of questions which are you know, general so that you have some room to move and stuff like this. And then just do them at home, then come in during that class and then just hand them in. And I'll try to get the uh, papers marked as quickly as possible because I really like to have you know, the uh, projects and the exams all done within the context of the course so I can give you feedback on your work which is meaningful to you. So, okay. And then the next uh, section, just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the whole section, but then I just put down a section on the key questions of things that we've already gone through, which is to say this course will think the question of technology in traditional terms, in terms of the relationship of technology to questions of political and social justice and questions of equity. And it's always looking for these divided perspectives, perspectives you know, that really say that technology is all about enhancing human perspectives, delivering us to a new utopia, and other perspectives that say, well, maybe we're entering into a kind of real dystopia. And all those matrix-like films on the kind of dystopian visions of the future, maybe that's another kind of authentic response to technology. And then we'll look for those kind of middle positions that negotiate between these two. Like, how do you actually use these technologies? You know, what are their limits, but also what are their uses in some ways? So, really look for a variety of perspectives in this way. So those are the key questions. And I said by focusing on the relationship of technology to gender and class, race and power, the intent of the course is to provide a more comprehensive and creative understanding of the question of technology. In this sense, opening up the question of tech to critical questioning also points to new directions for the political imagination in the 21st century. And then I put down notes in terms of the relationship of technology to history and to cultural diversity the methodology of this course, and the fact that for myself, and I couldn't emphasize enough the point which is creating a personal philosophy, that the, after we get through the first class, the class will not be, you know, I'll deliver a lecture, but the class will only work to the extent there's lots of dialogue between people in the class and you're asking questions and then, you know, we're really, you know, the class works, there'll be lots of discussion that's going on in the class all the time. And for myself, that's really great because a uh, class should, any class that really works is a class that really should, you know, profoundly affect your identity. It should, in fact, really stimulate thinking in terms of your own personal philosophy from an ethical standpoint. And where do you stand on questions of gender and class and race? And where do you stand on questions of these different perspectives on technology itself? So classes work, I think, will when they sort of move in two directions, that they become intensely personal so that the questions have some engagement with you. And I see that as my responsibility as a teacher, to try to present material clearly and interestingly enough so that, because these are really animated perspectives, you know, these are really heartfelt perspectives that are being presented in this book. So that's one on one side. But on the other side, I think the class really works when you're able to go beyond simply personal philosophy and able to generalize your perspective to understand, you know, the global situation in some ways. And it's really nice when you get like an educated imagination and you get sort of like a poise and you go between your understanding of yourself and these questions in relationship to your own life. But on the, on the other hand, like, you know, many generations of great political science students that have come out of Concordia, you have great, this great facility to talk about international politics or Canadian politics or comparative or theory. You know, just real sense of flu fluency itself, like many of your many generations of political science students before you have done. In my experience of having taught here for 21 years, okay, so here we are. Okay, should we take a break? Do you want to take a break? Would you like a break? We take a break, and then, um, then we'll if you don't mind, if you just take a short break, come back, and I'll just quickly go through the class schedule. I know it's a first class and I don't want to belabor the point and stuff like this. But I like to go through the schedule and then just give a little introductory riff. Okay. <laughs>